because this is a really controversial thing to talk about. Um, the biggest problem with hiring is not hiring the wrong person. It's keeping the wrong person. It's time! Work! Play! I want to connect the listeners to the best of the best. Welcome to the Evolved Broker Podcast. I'm your host, Pat Costello, the co-founder and principal at Evolve MGA. Our mission for the podcast is to bring the insurance industry the best of the best. My guest today is known as America's business psychologist. He's the author of 17 best-selling books, including Why Smart People Make Dumb Mistakes With Their Money, Mastering the Game, and Willpower, The Secrets of Self-Discipline and Sales Magic. He travels across the world to give keynote speeches to help business owners achieve peak performance. Some of his clients include American Express, Wells Fargo, Ford, Aetna, and Porsche. His name is Kerry Johnson. Today, I will be speaking with him about his new book called How to Recruit, Hire, and Retain Great People. He will go through The Great Resignation, How to Find Great People, Secrets to the Interview Process, and How to Retain Individuals. This topic could not be more relevant to the insurance world today. Please download, subscribe, and leave a review on whatever platform you are listening on, and feel free to reach out to me at Pat at evolvedbrokerpodcast.com with any comments or suggestions for the podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by First Insurance Funding. First is the leading premium finance company in insurance and is known throughout the industry for their personalized service and quote flexibility. If you're tired of sending quote requests for smaller premiums to multiple companies, not leaving enough time to negotiate larger opportunities, then choose First as your primary financing source and experience the first difference today. Without further ado, here's Carrie. Carrie, welcome to the Evolved Broker Podcast. Thanks, Patrick. I appreciate you spending time with me. And I guess what I'd really like to dive into in this conversation is the content of your new book, which is based around recruiting. But before I get there, I know that you are known as America's business psychologist. Can you talk to our audience about why you are called America's business psychologist? Uh, yeah, a couple of reasons. Number one, I was a stockbroker in uh, 1981. I used to make 150 cold calls every day. I got rejected 149 times every single day, except <laughs> I called my mom in the afternoon. And even, uh, even she back in those days would say, never call me again. <laughs> so this is psychologist uh, basically are, are the time emotion industrial psychologist sort of people that go into management. They try to see how people can be more efficient, um, how to uh, basically HR kind of stuff. What I do that's different than that is I'll go into a company or most of the time I'll speak and we'll speak about how to increase business by 80% within eight weeks. I'll talk about uh, um, uh, my newest book, How to Recruit, Hire, Retain Great People, and about 16 other books that I've written over the last 40 years. So I've spoken at uh, the Big I, the PIA, um, agency meetings around the country, MGAs all over the place, and the, those topics are things like how to reach your client's mind, um, how to increase your business by 80% within eight weeks, the trust connection, and also this topic, how to recruit, hire, retain great people. In fact, a quick story. Um, I was uh, speaking to a million dollar round table, which I'm sure your listeners are pretty really aware of. And this guy wrote me a letter uh, uh, after about a month afterwards. He said, you know, that touch and below the elbow thing you talked about, that really works. I said, uh, and I called him. I said, how come? He said, well, I went to Katrina's restaurant. The server with a tray of tequila shoot just kind of wandering around. He walked up and said, you have some problems tonight? She said, yeah, it's a bad economy. Nobody wants tequila. I don't know what the problem is. He said, listen, I just heard the speaker touch that guy over there on the arm, just like a tap, um, and see if it works. She said, I'm not going to touch anybody. He said, nothing else is working. She touched him on the arm and said, would you like to buy a tray for yourself, a tequila, or a, 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 tray, a tray for the whole table? She had the whole thing sold in 10 minutes, walked out of this beautiful bay front window over the Vancouver Bay, and uh, put the tray down. The guy that heard me speak walked up and said, did it work? She said, really well. 
uh, he said, why don't you get out of the tray? She said, I don't want to do it more. It worked too well. I think, I think it's unethical. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Jedi mind trick. Can you break down the psychology behind, behind touching someone below the elbow? And I'm guessing you mean on the forearm, right? Yeah. So we know that if you touch somebody more than three seconds, uh, any place, you know, uh, obviously the public areas are arm, shoulder, et cetera, nothing else besides that. Uh, we know that uh, if you touch somebody, it increases memory for that co comment by 83 percent more than if you just said it. So during speeches, I'll, I'll say to this group, say something nice to the person next to you and they'll kind of laugh and say something nice. And I'll say this time, say the nice thing and touch them on the arm and see if there's a difference. And I'll say, how, you know, uh, did it work? And uh, then I'll uh -huh. say, any of you pick up any business? And I'll raise their hand. It's, it's, <laughs> it's great. It's really funny. There's actually, well, just one quick thing. There's actually yeah. a little research project that was done at University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. And they, uh, uh, they went to the library. And librarians were trying to get people to bring books back in two weeks instead of just keeping them. So the librarian was trying to touch the student on the arm as the student reached for the book. Well, the result of that was 89% uh, of the students brought the book back with the two weeks. But here's the kicker. Only 5% of the students who were touched ever realized they've been contacted. That, so not only is it a, not only is it a Jetty mind trick, uh -huh. I mean, it, but it, it really gets people to focus on what you want them to think about and remember. That's phenomenal. That's immediate value for the listeners right there. Touch someone below the elbow. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I think that uh, it adds credibility behind your title, America's Business Psychologist, right away. The book that you wrote, the book that we're going to go through, How to um, Recruit, Attracting and Retaining Great People, is a topic that is super, super relevant for the insurance world today. And in myself going through it, I, it was extremely detailed. And I think it's phenomenal for anyone within an insurance company, agency, firm, whatever it might be, that is looking to hire and retain great people in today's world. Uh, I think it's phenomenal because it gets extremely detailed uh, down to the point where there's literally scripts, secrets that you can use along the way. The first major point that you touch on in the book though, Carrie, that I'd love, you, love for you to break down a little bit for us is the great resignation. I know it's a buzz phrase, that a lot of people are using, but can you break down what the great resignation is and the impact on U.S. businesses? Yeah, so unemployment right now is 3.6%. You think, well, 3.6%, everybody that's working, that wants to work is probably working. Well, the participation rate, though, is only about 62%. What that means is uh, there's uh, unemployment is low, but very few people are actually going back into the workforce. Uh, very few people are actually applying for jobs, et cetera, et cetera, which is why we see companies that are, are shut down in operations. Uh, my wife is a flight attendant for American Airlines. They can't find pilots. They can't find uh, flight attendants. The great resignation that actually happened when all these massive amounts of people were laid off, the government was giving um, 1200 bucks here, um, uh, PPP to companies like some of these agencies that you're talking about. So they were used to getting, uh, you know, a subsistence, maybe another thousand bucks on top of what they were currently getting. A lot of people said, you could take this job and shove it. I don't want to go back to that, you know, crap job anymore that I don't like anyway. I'm just going to try to see if I could live off my savings. The the bad news is the great resignation is is real. It's happening to every single company. The good news is the great resignation is occurring with um, pretty much all age brackets, especially people over 55, and they're going to run out of money. The uh, other bad news is when someone's out of the workforce for three or four years, they lose their skill set. And it's really difficult for those people to go back into regional manager position or maybe a executive or a consultant position because they're now three or four years behind the curve. So we're seeing those people slowly get back in because they realize they, they can't live on their savings and they can't spend that much time out of the workforce. Can you explain, Kerry, why the Great Resignation has also had an impact on uh, Gen X and Gen Z? Yeah, that's, um, that's really interesting. Well, as we go through this interview, we're going to talk about the five reasons why people leave a company yep. and the five reasons why people join a company. And the Gen, the Gen X and the Gen Zs um, – 
basically people that are under about 35 years of age decided that they really don't like what they're doing. Uh, they, I'll, I'll give you one right now, fun. Uh, Gen X, Gen Z people usually uh, leave a company because they're not having enough fun. So when you get into a company and you know you have a manager who demands you to be there at nine o'clock in the morning, and you, uh, if you're a salesperson that demands uh, a quota uh, or sales production, they just don't like that anymore. And uh, they, they'd rather do something more fun. So they're looking for something else. So they're out of the workforce. Yeah. Again, that, that also will come back pretty quickly. I predict that, uh, uh, that those two generational uh, groups are going to get back into the workforce in the next 18 months. So it's going to be, it's going to be really painful for a while. That's a really interesting group we've had. So at Evolve MGA, our, our cyber insurance business, we've had experiences with a couple of folks that fall in that demographic that have not had experience elsewhere. Um, and the pandemic was a unique X factor that I think caused people to be isolated, have a lot of time on their hands, um, you know, looking for some sort of change. The grass is greener because they've never seen anywhere else. And so it's been very interesting to see that group go through the great resignation. And so I, I've personally felt the great resignation. We're looking for great people. A lot of folks in the insurance industry are looking for great people. What can we do to find great people? Um, well, let's talk about what not to do. Okay. So usually what people typically do is they go to Indeed, ZipRecruiter, we call those job boards, um, or you know the, the newspaper uh, ads that maybe 10 or 20 years ago. So they look at these people and they, they you know, even though there's a great resignation, maybe they get uh, five resumes, maybe they get 20 resumes. The problem is that when you're doing those kind of things, you're filtering, you need to filter out about 95% of the people who are just totally wasting your time. Hey, Patrick, uh, listen, I want to hear about the job. What's it? Tell me what's going on with the job. So you're going to, who wants to do that 19 times to find one person that's going to be qualified enough that we want to talk to a little bit more. Seriously. So that's, that's typically what people do. And I, and I have an answer for that called virtual voicemail, but let's go into that one. The other um, thing that we're discovering right now with the re resignation, the low participation rate is we need to recruit. We don't need to search. We need to recruit. And what that means is recruiting basically means we're actively looking for people to talk to. The way to do that is uh, talk to what I call nominators. Uh, uh, besides you, Patrick, there's probably maybe 20, 30 people that you know, buddies I play golf with, I play tennis with, people I hang with that are um, uh, business owners or maybe they're managers. They all interview people. Maybe somebody that wasn't good for them could be good for me. So here's what we need to say to people on a daily basis. My job um, is one, two, three. Who do you, this is critical. Who do you know who could be good at this kind of position? Now, what they're going to hear is who needs a job. So what we need to say to them is I'm not looking for somebody who you think needs a job. I'm looking for somebody who could be good. Because I want to recruit the people, not look for people that don't have a job right now. Yeah, I think it's a good differentiation. Can you talk about virtual voicemail? Yeah, the virtual voicemail is, is a really cool concept. So we, uh, uh, we developed this about 10 years ago because um, some of the recruiters, managers were calling and uh, are getting these phone calls and people were calling with uh, like, uh, hey, I want to hear about the job. You know, I haven't worked in six years, but tell me all about the job and let me waste about 10 or 15 minutes of your time because I'm probably not going to show up for the interview anyway. So why not do that on a voicemail instead of actually uh, fielding these kind of phone calls or totally wasting your time? So virtual voicemail, uh, means that these people are calling into a voicemail, which is basically a soft phone. A soft phone is an, a vo voicemail only. It's a it's a it's uh, another extension to your company. It could be another line you get from Verizon, doesn't matter. And this voicemail says this exactly. My name is Patrick Costello. I have a, a, a company called Evolve MGA. We're looking for somebody that can, I'm going to make this part up, somebody that can uh, 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 be a sales administration assistant. The hours are eight to five. We're a fast growing company. Now, here's the really critical part. Please leave up to a one minute message on what you have done that has prepared you to be successful at this position. Let me say that one more time. 
please leave up to a one minute message on what you have done that has prepared you to be successful at this position. So listen to what I didn't say. I did describe the job. I gave them a, just a little elevator speech and I asked them to tell me what they have done that's prepared them. So we're listening for two things, energy, past performance, we could train for skills. We're looking for somebody who can be energetic. We're looking for somebody answers the question. Can they give me past performance? So we're listening for somebody to say things like, yeah, my name is Kerry Johnson. Um, I uh, was able to work uh, for about two years for another insurance company. We were able to increase their sales by 25%. I'm really interested in hearing what your job is. I want to hear that kind of thing. Here's what. Here's the kind of person we don't want to hear. Yeah, this is, uh, my name is Kerry Johnson. My phone number is 714, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, give me a call. I want to hear about the job. That's, not only do they not listen to the voicemail, they didn't even answer the question. Plus, they have no energy, no past performance. So you can... Uh, 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 keep for wasting a heck of a lot of time if you use virtual voicemail. Yeah, I like that, especially the energy and the effort components of that voicemail. I know I just generally enjoy working around high energy people and people that are ready to put put in the work, people that have the right attitude. Yep. So I also think that is a great filtration system, and it's like a it's like a pre interview, right? Yeah. Which I think the filtration is key. On our end with Evolve, we have a filtration system built through a personality system called Culture Index, which we actually did a podcast with uh, one of the executives from Culture Index, which basically we, we have a unique filtration system where we will not move forward with an interview unless someone already meets within a percentage of a personality match to a given role. And I know personal, personality tests are not the end all be all. That's actually a point I know you go through towards the end of your book. How do you think that businesses should use personality tests in their recruiting processes? Okay, so personality tests are really good for about a third of the decision on whether or not we should hire somebody. The problem with the personality test is um, a personality t- typically measures a uh, heck of a lot of stuff. What we need to do is measure the personality of the people that are already working for you. So if we have two people that are working as uh, administrative assistants, let's do the test on them and see how well the new candidate uh, measures up on the test according to what you already have. If you have uh, six or seven salespeople, let's do a test on them and see if we can uh, do um, a benchmark to try to find the people that are most likely to be able to measure on that. What I think is a lot more important though is past performance. So the past performance part is really important. If I was going to do a calc on that, I would say that at least 50, 60% of the decision to hire somebody should be on the job they did in the past. I've, I've got this mantra, this motto, I really believe it. Uh, how people behaved in the past is indicative of how they're going to behave in the future. So the past is prologue how people behaved before is going to be likely to what they're going to be like in the future. And the only way you can really do that is ask the candidate. But the best way to find out is talk to talk to past employers. Right. Now, there's a big problem here, too. So because if you talk to a past employer, they're uh, they're under this delusion, which is not true, that they can't talk about a past employee. The truth of the matter is they can't talk about a past employee lied about. They can't have liable, but they can talk about the person. So here's a couple of techniques we have. When you talk to a past employer and get the last two people, uh, by the way, we don't want to have um, uh, recommendations because I don't want them to talk about a friend they had. My, my daughter worked in San Diego with this um, uh, golf course. And the manager, she was a um, wedding director. The manager called and said, yeah, uh, Caroline Johnson put down uh, you as her uh, recommendation. Uh, can you tell me something about her? And I said, well, yeah, I'm her father. Do you, may, are you expect me to say, say something, uh, anything except wonderful things about her? And he kind of <laughs> laughed. He kind of laughed and said, okay, this is a wasted phone call. Uh, so when we talk to past employers, we need to say this. Um, number one, here's the job I have. Can you tell me uh, why or why not Why not they uh, could or could not be successful at this position? Now, the real cool thing is if a past employer says, I can't talk about them, there's two techniques we have to be able to get through that. Number one is, um, is kind of make a joke out of it and kind of loosen the manager up. I know you can't talk about them, totally understand that. But if you could talk about them, what would you say? 
Now they'll laugh at that and they'll think, oh, that's kind of funny, you know, and uh, oh, well, they were really great. Uh But the the, the go-to one that everybody needs to know is to be able to say, we have a policy at our company to uh, evolve MGA. We can't hire people unless we could get some information about the the past company. Um, It'd be a shame if I couldn't hire them because I couldn't get the information. And then just shut up. If that manager doesn't say anything, but yeah, they were really great. They weren't, they probably got fired. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, really interesting. And getting those references, I think shines a very unique light on how that person was. We actually just had somebody that came to the door that we, we did pretty much exactly what you're talking about. And the manager was like, I would absolutely work with this person again. And it was just immediate validation as to, you know, what we were kind of thinking throughout the interview process. I almost think about the whole interview process is like, you're kind of slowly gaining pieces of information about an individual's profile and trying to just make sure everything lines up with what you are looking for. Yeah. So you mentioned a couple platforms that people can use to find candidates, uh, whether it's Indeed or LinkedIn. Is there like an ideal place that we should be looking for these candidates? Is there like an online platform that you recommend or uh, for specific industries, is there places that you think people should look? No, I think, uh, to be honest with you, I think they're all the same. Indeed, LinkedIn, uh, ZipRecruiter, they're all the same. Uh, they flag for certain keywords within the resume. Uh, they uh, uh, send a note out to the, uh, these people. They send a note out to the employer, and they try to match these people up. It's kind of like the match game or you know a dating service kind of a thing. It doesn't say anything about the person's performance. It just yep. looks at the resume. Yep. So that's why it's so critical to this past employer. Uh, the best way to find great people is the nominator process that we just talked about a couple of seconds ago. So here's a couple of stats. We know that 68% of the population out there right now, uh, people working, are actively looking for another company to work for. 68% are looking. Now, on top of that 68%, uh, if you look at the active candidates, uh, another uh, group that equals 83% are called passive candidates. There are people who would be would consider looking for somebody else, something else, but not, not actively looking. You're never gonna find the active candidates on ZipRecruiter, uh, Indeed, LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. We've got to work with these people through the nominator process. And those are the people that we know that we say, hey, listen, we're looking for somebody. Who do you know who could be good? Uh-huh. Now who needs a job? Who do you know who could be good? And then we actively call these people and recruit them. Okay. That was going to be my next question is what's, what's the difference between active and passive candidates? Because I think it's great the way you break that down. And it's also pretty interesting when we've looked at the difference between those two. A lot of times it just seems like active candidates are generally, you know, active like regularly, you know what I'm saying? Or there's a reason why they're active and it may, it may have a reflection on their ability to be successful in their current role. It may not, it may not, but a lot of times, especially with passive candidates, if you can see their experience and how long they've been with the company, you know, a lot of times it's a, it's someone who is, um, could potentially be doing better at their job. I don't, do you think one is better than the other? Uh, you mean, uh, of the job boards, the, uh, the LinkedIn of ZipRecruiter thing? Active candidates versus passive candidates. I think passive candidates are a lot better than the active ones yeah. because we, we don't really know why the active uh, candidate left yep. because uh, anybody that's under 35 is going to work for, for you for about 3.5 years and they're going to go someplace else. Interesting. So the passive candidates um, are people that probably are happy where they are. Uh, they're, they're, maybe they're looking for a better position, but they're, they're happy enough that they're going to stay where they are. The active people might uh, trade jobs every year, every two years. I'd much rather look for the active people. I'm yeah. sorry, the, the passive people. And the only way to get the passive people is the nominator process. That's a really interesting stat that you just threw out. You said – people under 35 are going to move in 3.5 years. Did I get that right? Yeah. They're not going to stay with you more than 3.5 years. And often it's going to be less. So my daughter graduated from uh, James Madison uh, in Virginia uh, College. 
And uh, I went to her graduation, of course. And there was a, a woman that lived in L.A. Uh, she was going to move back. Her parents were in L.A. She's going to be back. And I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity. I interviewed her. She was wonderful. And uh, I said, great. Um, you, know, you start today. And after I think it was um, September 15th, she said, I'm leaving. Why? Well, I'm going to work for Enterprise Rent a Car. Are you serious? You know, again, I, I, I'm speaking around the world. I'm, I'm writing these books. You can work for Enterprise? Yeah. And she said, yeah, because they have beer parties on Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a person who could have gone along with their company, but she chose to this because of that, that one thing that we talked about a few minutes ago that we, I wasn't enough fun. She wanted to work for a company that was more fun. And that was, wow. a, she was somebody that would work for, for me for maybe about three and a half, four months. And that was it. Yeah. That's really wild. It's, we're also in such a unique situation. I live in the Marina district of San Francisco. There's a lot of tech sales folks in that area and a lot of tech sales folks that have literally never even seen their office and yeah. have almost no connection to their coworkers, especially on an uh, in-person, like, you know, close relationship basis. So I just wonder how, how much of an impact that's going to have as, you know, the, the world moves forward. And if more mandates for in-person work coming to the office are going to be on their way. Um, boy, you know, I can't speak to that. Uh, I know a lot of people that are doing remote work right now want to keep doing it yeah. uh, because they want to be home more. They're their fathers, their mothers. They want to be with their kids more than more family time. And a lot of companies, especially um, uh, Silicon Valley companies, are demanding people that are coming back at the office. But sometimes they do it on a flexible basis. Yep. Sometimes it's revolving, which brings us to another recruiting uh, uh, concept. Some of the uh, people that are filling in the gap with the great resignation are those people over 50, 55. So those people uh, often left or they're on a retirement track, mainly because they don't want the pressure. They don't want to uh, work uh, 10 hours a day. They want to take more time off. So what we're seeing right now also is flexibility. We're seeing companies that are saying, how much time can you give me? Um, what days do you want off? Um, how much travel, you know, how much can we de decrease the travel yeah. to be able to keep, keep you with the company or have you work with the company? Okay. So we're seeing a lot of that flexibility right now also. Okay. Let's say that you filtered a candidate through your uh, recruiting system and you think they look good and you've moved on to like the official interview process. What yeah. secrets do you have to the interview process? Yeah. The, uh, one of the best secrets is you interview, not, not you, but uh, people that uh, hire people interview subjectively i want p i want your listeners to interview objectively when we interview we interview people like us uh i'm gonna hire you because you're like me uh you get my jokes you get my concepts you, you you're quick-witted uh you're articulate that uh, that's what i like so therefore you're like me and i want to hire you yeah but uh, i'm a salesperson and i'm trying to hire someone for administration position yeah but there's so much like me that's why we make mistakes so the, the trick is 13 key questions that cause people to interview objectively, not subjectively. So we weight each of these questions. Uh, we weight them and then we compare scores against candidates. So for example, uh, why did you leave your last job? Uh, that's worth um, about uh, five points. Now that's every qu time you ask a question for candidates, it's worth the same points. Now, a great answer would be, I left my last job because I wanted more opportunity. I wanted to um, with, be with a company that grew. I wanted to uh, increase my income. I wanted to contribute more. A bad answer, which gets a one, that gets a five. This gets a one. Oh, I didn't like my boss, and uh, they may work too hard, and I wanted more time off. And you know, I just, so I just didn't click with the people I was working with. So that's why you leave your last company. Another great one is what I call the less assumed technique. Uh, this is um, worth 15 points. Uh, and uh, this also was, you know, as far as uh, how to recruit, hire, and retain great people, this is a great uh, question to, to retain people also. But let's use it on the recruiting process. Let's assume is, let's assume you, you've been here for four years. Remember our three and a half thing? Uh -huh. What happened to let you know it was a great company to work for, and you and I personally had a wonderful relationship? What did you get? 
what we're listening for is how they could contribute to the company, not um, how they could get more time off or make their life easier. So we want to hear things like, I want to be with a company that's growing by 15, 25%. I want to be uh, somebody that's uh, able to learn more. I want to get trained. I want to be able to develop with the company. I want to be able to uh, 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 increase my, my family's uh, um, uh, a status by you know working with a company that's fast growing. Those are the kind of things that are worth 15 points. The things that are worth one point or two points are, um, I want more time off. Um, I don't want to have any more conflicts with people. My boss was overbearing. He was a micromanager. I didn't like that. We want to work, uh, work towards growth, not how much they can make their life easier. That's worth 15 points. Now, there's uh, 13 other questions like this, but it, it gets down to the bottom one, which is the most fun. It's I call it, sell me this pen or sell me this pencil. So this is worth 35 points, by the way. So there was a... Uh, uh, Tommy Hopkins uh, told a story a lot of years ago <coughs> about uh, the father of modern day sales. His name is Jay, Jay Douglas Edwards. And Jay Douglas was on the Mike Douglas show about uh, 1960. And Mike Douglas had daisies in the walls. <coughs> he was a chain smoker. And he uh, said, uh, Jay Douglas, come in here. Uh, we got three minutes left on the show. And I want you to sum of this ashtray. Jay Douglas said, I'll use a cup as an ashtray. Uh, hey, Mike, what do you like about the ashtray? Oh, you know, I love the channels on top. You know, it's got little cigarette uh, indentations. Like, I, I think that's really cool. What I still like about the ashtray? Well, it's heavy. It's a paperweight. We got these swamp coolers blowing around. And, uh, you know, I want to do research in between the breaks for the next guest to come on. I like that a lot. Um, what else you like about it? I like the green. It's kind of translucent. I can see through it. I can see the papers down below. I like that a lot. Well, Mike, how much would you pay for that ashtray? I don't know, three fifty, four bucks. Jay Douglas said, sold. It's yours. I love that story because not only is he listening, Mike, into buying from him, uh, but it's a great story because when you go to a candidate, we're going to use that by saying, some of this pen, some of this pencil. The candidate, every single time, is going to say, oh, it's gray. That's this is my S pen, by the way. It's gray. Uh, it's uh, got a wonderful eraser, and it's a 0.7 lead on it. You'll like it a lot. And then you tell the Jay Douglas story. And then we find out whether or not they're coachable. Can they do it the way the story was, or they go right back to what they just did a couple of minutes ago? And that gets 35 points. Are they coachable? And if they're not during the interview, they're probably not going to be coachable when they're working with you either. Coachability is key. Coachability yeah. is key. And getting that right candidate in there and training them, I think, is also a big element of whether like your organization is going to be successful at like bringing these people in. And also like, you know, I think a lot of times in your book, you mentioned you want to hire for energy. You want to hire for attitude. You want to hire for work ethic and you want to hire for skill, but skills probably on the far, the far end of that spectrum. Is that right? Yeah, we could to, to a certain extent, you know, some skills you can't, you need to yeah, have. Like right. this person is a, a coder for Apple or this guy codes for AI. Uh, this person does facial recognition development. We need yep. that kind of yep. thing. But anything short of that, those key critical skills, we need to hire for somebody who's going to have energy past performance. And yeah. generally we could trade for skills. Yeah, I think a good training program is a good insurance policy to make sure that you can consistently bring in those candidates. And then also for certain roles, I know you're a big fan of recruiting from within. Can you speak to recruiting from within? Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite authors, Jim Collins, wrote a book called Good to Great. And uh, Jim Collins said uh, uh, during one of his key for, uh, parts of this thing, he said, before you kick somebody off the bus, why don't you see if they're if they could change seats? So Collins' attitude was, if if someone's not surviving in sales, yeah. um, maybe maybe they could be good as in sales support. If someone's not really doing all the great of a job with, um, you know, administrative production, maybe they might be really good with training. So let's try to find out what skill sets they have because they wouldn't work with you at all in, in the first place if they didn't have energy, past performance, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe they're better suited towards something else. I There was a, a, a assistant working with me a lot of years ago. Her name is Sherry. And I lost a salesperson that was booking me as a speaker named Andrea. Andrea left, was recruited by another uh, speaker. And uh, Sherry said, you know, um, I'd like to give that a shot. I said, well, Sherry, you're – been my sister for a couple of years. And do you really think this is something that you like? She said, I, I sold, um, 
uh, studio time for basic uh, artists and bands from my father's studio, I, th I think I could probably do this too. And she turned out to be wonderful. And I never knew she had those kind of skills. Wow. Because I she was working with me because she had energy past performance, but I never knew about that part. That's pretty cool. That, that's great to figure out if someone has a different skill set, especially, you know, who knows if that person's on their way out of the organization, either by their choice or by your choice to kind of just explore where they could be a better fit. Sometimes it's best to just fire the person and fire the person for the morale of the team. Can you talk about when the right time is to cut somebody off when you've hired them and, and maybe you, you realize they're not working out? Yeah, this is a. I'm really glad you read that part of the book because this is a really controversial thing to talk about. Um, the biggest problem with hiring is not hiring the wrong person; it's keeping the wrong person. So when we hire people, we assume that they're going to be wonderful. Uh, maybe they work out, maybe they don't. Uh, but the problem is, if you keep bad people or if you keep mediocre people, uh, other people are. Uh, uh, demotivated by that person working with them. Uh, there's everybody knows about some negative person in the job. They come in to complain about things, and it kind of drives everybody else in the company uh, crazy because a a producers like to work with a producers. Yeah, I, I talk in the book about um, uh, some of the baseball teams and the football teams, like, like the Rams. There's nobody on the Rams team that won the Super Bowl this last year. Of course, you and know, I watched that. I'm a Rams fan. I lived in uh, oh, LA no. for a couple of, a lot of years. Oh no, Kerry, <laughs> I, I, I was I at that Rams Niners. Uh... NFC Championship game down in down at SoFi, so brutal yeah. brutal loss for my Niners. Yeah, well, I saw I saw the game too, but there's nobody on that team, uh, the Rams team or the San Francisco team, that's going to say, "Yeah, we could have won, except the quarterback's an idiot. They, he should never should have had a quarterback." Yeah, we could have done a lot better, except the defensive line was a total idiot. This guy, I don't know what we had him there. No, they always say um, the quarterback uh, was just wonderful. I loved him. Our receivers just lights out good. They always talk about how good the other players are. A players love to work with A players. Yeah. So if you have somebody that's not an A player on your team, maybe it's time to find out uh, to get rid of that person and, and hire an A player. Yeah. Because they're because they're probably dragging the team down. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Is there first? Let's just take a sales role for example. Is there like a specific amount of prescribed transgressions that you would put up with before you're like, oh, you know what? This person didn't hit their numbers for three months in a row. Performance plan time. Do you have a prescribed amount of time to keep a salesperson or like, is there metrics that you are specifically tracking like KPIs that would cause you to make that cut? Uh, number one, we have to find out when the cut is or when the, what the KPI is initially. Yeah. So, for example, if I have a sales producer and their goal is to do, um, let's talk about premium. I want them to do 20000 bucks of premium. Yep. Uh, and I'll say to them when they get hired, listen, I expect you to do 20000 bucks of premium uh, uh, within three months. Yep. I'm going to give you a ramp up period, but that's got to be that 20000 bucks in three months. So, number one, we have to set a bar for people. We just can't say to somebody, well, last la, last month you did ten thousand. Okay, your new new goal is going to be twenty thousand. We have to do that at the very beginning. We have to have a KPI at the very at the get go. Number two is uh, when we work with people, we need to be able to set that bar, but we also need to have know how to praise and reprimand. So I call this the three step praise. <clears throat> um, among all the things that uh, people stay in a job for, uh, money is almost never number one. It's usually number one when people want to join a company. It's never number one when people leave a company. So therefore, um, if, if we know that money's not number one, if we know that praise is probably between two or three, you can actually praise people into becoming better at something through what we call the three-step praise. And uh, a way to do that is called success of approximation. So let's say that I want somebody uh, to be able to make more contacts. I want them to talk to more brokers. And we know that the uh, some of the KPIs are if you talk to 10 brokers, you're going to find two of them that want to uh, find out more about it. We can do an opening fact finder with one of them, uh, uh, to, let's say two, and one of them is going to buy from us. So that, that key performance indicator is 10 brokers every week, uh, two people want to hear one sale. So they're not doing it. 
maybe they're doing maybe they're doing two. So we we set the bar with these people saying I wish you do ten, but then we what we do is we don't um, say hey listen I'm going to praise you when you get to ten. We praise them for getting a little bit better at it. So the next week they talk to six. Great job, wonderful job. The next week they do seven. The next week they do eight. And then we praise it for doing 10. You can actually uh, 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 modify people's behavior by praising them increasingly, this thing called successful approximation, to become a better performer because it works better than money. Honestly, goodness. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm with you on praise. Is there any other elements beyond, okay, we have comp, we have praise. Is there anything else, like is company culture in there? I know that's a little bit harder or a little bit more general to define, but is there any other elements that you like to talk about when it comes to retaining those individuals? Yeah, um, what is called the state interview. So when we, someone leaves a company, what we typically do is we do an exit interview. So here's how it goes. Um, hey, Patrick, I just wanted to see you know, what we could have done better, what we did, what, what, uh, what, what we didn't do all that well. And Patrick is thinking, all I wanna do is get out of this office. I don't wanna be here. I wanna go to my new company, so I'm probably gonna lie. Yeah, it was so wonderful. You're a great guy. It was wonderful. Yep. This great, up, a better opportunity. So that never works. Yep. Why not do, do, do a state interview? Why not look at people that are with you for three years, four years, they're doing a super job and say, let's assume it's three more years. What happened to let you know it's a great company to work for and you and I had a great relationship? Or the, another way to say that is, what about this company makes you want to stay specifically? What about this company right now makes you want to stay with us? You're not saying to the person, hey, listen, I, you know, uh, I'm giving you a chance to leave right now. They'll tell you. They'll, they'll say, I don't like the comp system. I don't like um, uh, the way you demand us to be at these meetings with you're totally irrelevant, but I like the company. They'll tell you what's going to uh, keep them there. Okay. And they'll be very candid, very honest. Yeah. The stay interview. Stay That's interview. cool. I've never heard of that before. Was there anything else... Any other key elements in your book that you think our audience should be aware of when it comes to attracting or retrain, retaining high quality ta talent during the time just post this great resignation? Yeah. Um, one of the things I talk about in the book is called the wedge or how to re recruit people who are otherwise happy with where they are. So there's uh, you want to hire a salesperson. Um, there's really nobody out there right now. You need to recruit that salesperson. You find a candidate that really is pretty happy with what they're doing. What would you do, Patrick? What, how would you approach that? I'm trying to recruit a salesperson that is very happy with their with what they're doing. Yeah, uh, I would. Well, I think that you mentioned one of the first drivers mm -hmm. of someone going to a new job would be comp. So I would definitely consider what they're making at their current job and, and what we have the ability to offer or what they have the potential to make within our comp system. But beyond that, I think, I think really highlighting our brand and our culture and um, our, our current team to show them what life would be like if they joined our company, I think that would be really powerful, whether that's showing our web, with, highlighting all that stuff on our website, um, having them talk to individuals on our team, uh, giving, uh, really being ubiquitous about where they see us in terms of online advertising, social media, uh, posts uh, on different platforms, potentially ads. So those are, those are some ideas that come up to mind immediately. Okay. So your, your idea is to persuade or sell them on what, how much better your company is than the one they have. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, there's a study done by U.S. Trust. Okay. And this is a sales a sales study that uh, was done, but basically says that 84 percent of the population of a buyer's bought because they felt understood. Only six percent bought because they were made to understand. Okay. So if if we recruit that way, doesn't it also make sense that we can listen for people to tell us what they want and what they're not getting? Yep. And how we could fill in that gap, would that be better? Yeah, 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 totally, totally. So here, here, here's the technique. It's called the wedge. Okay. So let's let's do an elevator speech. 
Uh, let me do a quick rip on elevator speeches. I think the elevator speech is probably the most important thing we can do in sales or recruiting and anything. Elevator okay. speech has four parts. Number one, label yourself so I don't have to. Number two, give me three things you do better than anybody on earth. Number three, tell me a story. And number four, do a takeaway. Patrick, uh, I'm uh, America's business psychologist. I'm an MBA, PhD level psychologist, and I do three things. Uh, number one, I speak at conventions around the world on topics like how to hire, ret retain great people, how to reach your client's mind. Number two, uh, we have a coaching company. We do one on one coaching. We promise we'll increase our clients' uh, business by 80% within eight weeks. And number three, I speak, I, I write uh, a heck of a lot, and I've written 17 books. Um, I had one of uh, my clients say to me a couple of months ago, uh, his name is Rick Martin. His income went from 200 to 1.2 million. And I said, Rick, you were so consistent. How do you do that? He says, well, I was a Lieutenant Colonel in the Marines and during boot camp at DI, I said, sir, if you don't keep your promises, people die. And Rick said that was the best motivation lecture he ever went through. Patrick, I'm not sure that's going to benefit you at all, but I'd love to hear more about your company, about you, what you're looking for. So we've got to have a killer elevator speech. Okay. Number two, that, that, will tell, that will sell the company. It'll frame the company. Number two, the wedge technique is tell me about your company. What do you like? This is called an instant replay. Okay. If you tell me what you like, that means you, you want to go towards that in the future also. And then you say, or let's assume technique. Let's assume it's four years of the future. Let's talk about perfection. What did you get that made you think this is absolutely the perfect job? I can't get anything better. Well, I want to increase my salary by 25%. I want uh, compensation for an MBA. I want, to, uh, I want to be able to stay home a little bit more. Now, here's the key. Key phrase. Are you 100% sure with where you are right now, you're going to get there beyond a shadow of a doubt with where you are right now? If they, if they say yes, let's move on. But I don't think they're going to do that. Okay. If they say no, tell me why. Tell me why you're not sure. Tell me what what's lacking right now. Yeah. Then we do a trial close. If you and I could sit down and talk about how to get you there, would that be a benefit? And they're going to say yes. You're going to meet with them. I don't think we can recruit people by selling. I think we recruit people by finding out what they want, and and be able to persuade them that our opportunity is exactly what they want. Okay. Okay, cool. I like the concept, the wedge, right? The wedge technique, yeah. Cool. It's actually, that's, that's super applicable because there's a famous insurance sales book with an author named Randy Schwantz who has a book called The Wedge. So yeah. that'll, that'll be very memorable to a lot of our listeners. Well, Carrie, the final section we have for the podcast is five rapid fire questions that we put together for you. But before we get into those questions... Where can people find you? Uh, you're an international speaker. You're an author. You have uh, coaching programs. You have a lot of stuff going on. What should the listeners know about where to find you and what you have uh, to be able to offer to them? Well, number one, they uh, go to my website, which is kerryjohnson.com, K E R R Y. J-O-H-N-S-O-N.com. And if anybody, any of the listeners uh, would like more information on um, how to recruit, hire, retain great people, the book's going to be out in August, by the way. Um, but if anybody wants uh, uh, more information, uh, I'd love to send a video uh, to them, one hour video on how to recruit, hire, retain great people if they fill out a coaching evaluation. Uh, which uh, uh, just uh, has 20 questions they can rate themselves, send it back to me. We'll talk for 10 minutes, et cetera. And if any of you, uh, the listeners uh, want to book me as a speaker, same place, kerryjohnson.com, kerryjohnson.com. Uh, and again, the book is going to be out in August. Cool. And this podcast will be released right around then. So it will be Good. perfect timing. All right. Well, Kerry, if you're ready, we can move on to the five rapid fire questions. Can't wait. Let's do it. Okay. Question number one. What is your favorite example of a company that does recruiting phenomenally? 
I think Amazon does a great job of recruiting. There's other issues with the company I don't like, but Amazon does a great job. Intel does a great job. GE does a great job. One of the uh, financial companies I think is just really, really good at what they do uh, is Mass Mutual. Okay. Um, as far as the PNC space, you know, you probably would know bar- better than that. But yeah. I think the uh, uh, agencies are really set up to recruit, recruit, recruit. And some of these techniques are just up their alley. Nice. Okay. Great. As I mentioned before, you are an international speaker and an international traveler. Do you have a favorite city that you visited in the past? Do you see the background right now? Yes. Is it Laguna Beach? This is uh, Carvoro, Portugal. Oh, no way. Wow. I thought you were in Southern California. (laughs) (laughs) No, this is um, two and a half hours south of Lisbon. My probably one of my favorite city is Lisbon and my favorite okay. place to be. I'm here a uh, month every quarter. My favorite place is right here. And this is my terrace looking over the ocean. Very nice. I am jealous. Thank you. I've, <laughs> I've been to Lagos, Portugal. Um, La- Lagos, Lagos, Lagos is, uh, is uh, only 20 minutes uh, north of us. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I was there for just a weekend, but yeah. it was great. And the other thing is, I believe, so I'm from the Bay Area. Lisbon has a very similar bridge to the Golden Gate Bridge. I'm not sure if that's yeah. if that's true. It's the same the Va- architect, maybe? It's, it's called the Vasco da Gama Bridge. It's a really famous bridge. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Nice. That I wasn't expecting that answer. That's that's awesome. <laughs> um, okay. Well, so a, a lot of the guys probably also doesn't know that you are a professional tennis player. Who was the best tennis player that you ever played against? Jimmy Connors. Uh, Jimmy Connors uh, once played me at the Dallas, Texas Reunion Hall. Um, Dallas, Texas. Uh, he had one tennis court strategy with me in the first round match of uh, the WCT was called Clean My Clock. He beat me 6 0, 6 1, and I'm exaggerating that by one game. Uh-huh. Oh, man. Wow. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Actually, uh, to, be, to be honest, I was 95 yeah. in the world, so I, I wasn't all that bad. But uh, yeah, that's, 95 that's in very the world. Impressive. But you can't make you couldn't make money in the late seventies about being ninety five in the world though. Yeah, that that is uh, very impressive. Thanks, Carrie. You work with all sorts of industries. Do you have a favorite? Uh, yeah, I do. I think the the people that you work with are my favorites. I love I love people in the financial services because they're smart, they're motivated, they're trying to get an edge. A lot of uh, uh, industries that I work in. Um, they have salespeople that get paid salaries. Uh, they kind of sit there and think, do I need to know this? Is it, is it a happy hour yet? Yeah. It's five o'clock someplace, you know, yeah, yeah. the people, people in, in your industry are my favorite. I appreciate you saying that. I hope you're not just yeah. blowing smoke. No, I'm not. I really good, believe that. Yeah. I love it. Um, well, that's, that's very cool to hear. Final question. You spend most of your time in Southern California, right? No, I moved to Charleston about a year ago. You moved to Charleston. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, I guess this question then applies to Charleston. Do you have a favorite restaurant in Charleston? Yeah, it's called Halls. So Charleston dates back to 1635. And uh, the obviously Fort Sumter was the start of the Civil War, which is just uh, just out in the bay. And Halls Restaurant has the, uh, the I'm a, I'm a uh, kind of a pescatarian, so I eat meat maybe like once every two weeks, once a month or something like that. Okay. But it's got the best, best beef I've ever had in my whole life. The food at Charleston is unbelievably good. Cool. Good history yeah. on Charleston. I've, I actually have never been to Charleston and I've only heard really, really great things. I it's look, stunning. It's a great place. Yeah. I look forward to going um, soon and I'll keep halls on my mind. Yeah. Halls is the best. Yeah. Okay. Well, Carrie. That really wraps up the majority of questions. I'm fired up for the audience to get access to your new book about recruiting because I think, like I said in the beginning of this podcast, there's probably nothing that is more relevant to the insurance industry right now. I think every single firm in the insurance industry has felt the great resignation and we're all looking for great people and retaining those great people within our organizations. So I really appreciate you spending some time with me. And I'm excited to hear our listeners' um, feedback from this episode. So with that said, Carrie, I look forward to speaking with you soon, and we will wrap the episode up right here. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Carrie. Please download, subscribe, and leave a review on whatever platform you are listening on, and feel free to reach out to me at pat 
at evolvedbrokerpodcast.com with any comments or suggestions for the podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by First Insurance Funding. First is the leading premium finance company in insurance and is known throughout the industry for their personalized service and quote flexibility. If you're tired of sending quote requests for smaller premiums to multiple companies, not leaving enough time to negotiate larger opportunities, then choose First as your primary financing source and experience the first difference today. 